We have an assignment to do. There will be one more assignment on the topic of the simple harmonic oscillator, which uh, will be distributed later on. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and then we will have an exam. Um, the exam will cover the material through the simple harmonic oscillator which we might finish today, uh, we might finish tomorrow. I mean, well, probably won't finish it tomorrow, but we could finish it on Thursday. Uh, and then we will have an exam. Um, and, well, I haven't quite decided about the exam. I wanted to uh, get your uh, opinion. So the question is, what would you prefer? Would you prefer an exam of the type of the first exam, or would you prefer a tape? Wait, will the diploma be different? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the tape will be like. Yeah. Well, you're just going to design to be like horrendous, right? No, horrendous. Yeah, that's kind of this kind of guy. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, uh, the idea would be that there would be a lot less time pressure. Uh, the take-home exam, the idea is not to be, you know, of the difficulty, say, of the homework assignment, uh, but something that you have more time, but will be, you know, a little bit more involved, uh, you know. But it then has pluses and minuses, obviously, right? Uh, so. Think about it, and you can send me an email for your feedback, and we'll decide. You can just do one of those polls again. I'll just get your feedback, so let me know. All right. Uh, so, um, right. So we're talking about the simple harmonic oscillator in the last lecture. We were talking about different representations of the quantum problem with respect to different bases. Okay, so uh, we could express um, our representation in terms of what are called the number states, which is a countably infinite set of vectors that span the Hilbert space. The number states are the eigenstates of a dagger A. They are, the num they are the eigenstates of the number operator. And of course, they're also the energy eigenstates, right? And um, they form a resolution of the identity. Alternatively, uh, we could look at representations with respect to uh, the span of the states that are eigenstates of the position momentum operator. Okay, uh, those are those eigenvalues are continuously infinite, but nonetheless they form a basis for the space. They form another resolution of the identity. And we, of course, look at position momentum representations. Those are the wave functions, right? So we could talk about the state in terms of its expansion in the number basis or its expansion in terms of position and momentum states, okay? So we have different representations of operators. The raising and lowering operators with respect to the number basis are matrices. They're infinite dimensional matrices, but matrices nonetheless. Um, same for position and momentum. In the basis and the representation of position and momentum, of course, then position and momentum operators have representations as multiplication by constants and derivatives. Those operators then are the wave mechanical uh, operators.
illustrators that one is typically introduced to in introductory quantum mechanics. Yeah. I thought P was T dagger bias A. Uh, you are correct. Uh, no, hold on, let me think about that for a moment. You had it right. No, that's no, it is correct. That's the same. Is it right? Is it because the I? No, the I's in the middle. Oh. That's correct. Yep, that's correct. The reason we know that is that, of course, A is X plus I and T. Okay. So you subtract from A dagger, you divide by I, and you get the right thing. All right. Um, the uh, energy eigenfunctions, that's to say the uh, positional momentum representations of the energy eigenstates are easily derivable by just saying, by this defining equation, the ground state is annihilated by the lower operator. So when we look in the position representation, we have a differential equation for the ground state wave function which we can solve. And that equation tells us that the ground state of the subharmonic oscillator is a Gaussian. And the higher energy levels, the excited states, are obtained by applying the creation operator to that. And the creation operator applied to that involves taking the dagger of this, which is x minus the derivative with respect to x, n times on this. And what we get are these functions. Those functions are Gaussians that are multiplied by Hermit polynomials. The Hermit polynomials are, can be written in this way, compactly. In fact, one, there, uh, are a number of properties and sort of traditional theories of special function differential equations and so forth. You just study this kind of thing ad nauseum. We don't know so much anymore. But one of the things that's, for example, a useful property of Hermit polynomials, which is a kind of property you see of all hypergeometric functions, the so-called generating function. generating function tells us a way of obtaining the Hermit polynomials from a power series. So if I look at as a function of some parameter t, that Gaussian, one can show fairly easily that this is equal to the following. Polynomials are the expansion coefficients in a Taylor series expansion. There's an intimate relationship, which is basically due to this factor between Gaussians and Hermit polynomials. Um, the, uh, the other thing that we mentioned, briefly, it's very easy to see, is that the wave functions of, that are associated with the energy eigenstates in position space are exactly the same as they are in momentum space. And that's not surprising because the Hamiltonian is completely symmetric in position and momentum, right? And it's just a question of a phase convention that we have. So in momentum space, the uh, energy eigenfunctions are exactly the same with a factor, just to keep everything self-consistent, of I out front. Okay. 
And of course, we know that because we have a reflection symmetric potential for the simple harmonic oscillator about the origin, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are symmetric and anti-symmetric functions. So this is the ground state written at, which has a zero point energy and then we have the first excited state, the second excited state, etc.
Pink. One over two. Voila. So in the ground state,
and the uncertainty. Or the nth energy level. That's what I see. Okay? And the way to calculate that most easily is to use the algebra of a Okay? So let's do it. Of course, x is a plus a dagger over root 2, and t is a minus a dagger over i root 2. Okay. So, first of all, just quickly, what is this? Zero. Zero. Right? There is no mean value of a or a dagger for a number state because this raises or lowers, right? So what that tells me is that for a position eigenstate, sorry, for, that's you, for a number eigenstate, there is no mean position. Of course, we could have read that off the picture. It's a symmetric potential and the eigenfunctions squared are all symmetric functions. So therefore, the mean position is always 0 in a parity symmetric potential. So that's got to be true. Um, all right, what about the uncertainties? Well, that tells me that the uncertainty in position to the expected value of the square since the mean itself is zero, right? And that is equal to uh, a plus a dagger over root two to the power n. Root power two? Sorry, to the power two, thank you. Always out of the car. Okay, so now here's another trick of the trick. Whenever you're dealing with uh, it's looking at the algebra of A and A dagger, and you want to calculate something like an expectation value, the only non-zero terms are the ones that have an equal number of power of A's and A dagger. Right? I'm looking at the expected value of the n. Because otherwise, on one side I'm raising more than I'm lowering. Yeah? But that only implies if n is like equal to zero. If n is equal to zero, then you can only have that a a dagger term. True, but I, it, it's not that it, what, it doesn't negate what I said. Yeah. The only terms that are certainly not zero are those. Then in addition, there would be additional ones that are zero. So that, that means that, generally speaking, the only terms that survive are the ones with the equal numbers of a's and daggers. So there's an a, a dagger, and there's an a dagger, a. Now, as Stephen pointed out, if this were the ground state, then this term would not be there. All the terms that are so-called normally ordered, where the a's are on the left and they I'm sorry, the A's are on the right and the A dagger on the left vanish. But this is general. Okay. So how do you deal with this? Well, the easiest thing again is to what we say is normally order this. Put all this put this in the form where A daggers are on the left and the A's are on the right. That's just a jargon that comes to it. It's just called normal order, but don't worry about that. Why? Because then this is the number operator and we know how it acts on it. So this, if I, this is equal to a dagger a plus the commutator of a and a dagger. Right? Which is 1. So this is equal to 1 half 
uh, a is a dagger a is the number operator plus one times n. So the expected value of x squared is that, which is n plus a half. And it's very easy to show in exactly the same way that the expected value of p is the same thing as it should be, because it's got to be symmetric in x and p for the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, because the Hamiltonian is symmetric in x and p. Okay? Uh, what this says, of course, is that the energy is equally distributed between the kinetic energy and the potential energy, right? The Hamiltonian in dimensionless units is a half x squared plus p squared. And we know that this is n plus a half. So it's not surprising, we didn't even have to go through that, this thing, we could have just read that off by the yeah, as well. Alrighty, so what this tells me is that the uncertainty in position is uh, square root of n plus a half times the square root of a bar over omega and p sub n.
that doesn't affect any prediction of any probability because it's never going to affect the relative phase of anything. Okay. So we can completely ignore it. Just, you know, it's just a, 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 a where we decide to put the zero of energy. All right. So if we wanted to look at time evolution, there's lots of ways we could do it. Let's talk about the Heisenberg picture. And again, there's lots of ways we can think about the Heisenberg equation. Let's look at the Heisenberg equations of motion, first of all. So um, let's look at the What we see here is that the Heisenberg equations of motion for the harmonic oscillator are exactly the equations of motion that we had for the classical canonical words. Exactly. There's nothing different about them. Right? Um, and we can write down the solution. The Heisenberg operator A, the function of T, is A0 e to the minus I omega T. And X of T. The solution, you know, we can get that by writing A plus A dagger over root 2. Over I two is P zero. 
zero cos omega t minus x zero sine omega t. So that's a very important result. It says the harmonic oscillator has, in some sense, looks entirely classical. Yeah. Is, this looks like it's relevant in, in what we were supposed to be doing for like the squeeze operator in the Homer. Because the, the format just seems too similar to be classical. They're similar, but I mean, there's a, indeed, there is a, a the, the squeezing operator isn't uh, related to this kind of operation. It's something different. But the mathematics is quite similar. In fact, as we, I would say another way of getting this solution, instead of solving the differential equation, is just to directly time evolve this, the operator according to the unitary transformation. Right? That's another way we can get exactly this. Using the Baker Campbell Hausdorff, this is equal to either the plus i n hat omega t a zero even the minus i n hat omega t and then use multiple commutators this is equal to the sum n equals zero to infinity uh, the multiple commutators
for a harmonic oscillator, if I ask what's the probability to find the position of the harmonic oscillator somewhere, it spends most of its time near the turning points and middle time where the kinetic energy is large, right? And so the amplitude of this uh, average looks like a classical, uh, we had the wave function associated with this state was proportional to one over the square root of a classical kinetic energy at that position, where the classical kinetic energy at that position is, I mean, the classical momentum is the square root of the kinetic energy, which is the total energy minus potential times 2m. So, in some sense, there's an aspect of this which contains the classical dynamics in it. But is, if I prepare the harmonic oscillator, the quantum harmonic oscillator, in this wave function, if I somehow were able to create this energy eigenstate, would you say that the predictions of measurements that you would do would be what you would expect classically? Classically, this thing oscillates, right? And classically, the position of this guy, or I would just say this, Classically, right? What about if I prepared the state of the system in this state? What does this do? Does it oscillate? What is the expected value of position as a function of time? Does it oscillate? It's still zero. It's zero. Why? Well, it's true that the Heisenberg operators follow the classical trajectories, but for this guy, the mean value is zero at times equals zero for both of these things. And so it's zero for all times. This is a stationary state. And for a stationary state, nothing, no probability of anything changes as a function of time. So stationary states are not a associated with classical trajectories. You need to have a wave packet of different energy eigenvalues in order to have anything change as a function of time. Okay. Um, state it another way. So let me first state it this way. So stationary states are stationary. <laughs> Nothing changes with respect to time. So stated in another way, if I look in phase space,
characters together and you print off the square. <laughs> a stationary state is a state that corresponds to something which is completely uncertain where I am on the circle. I'm on the circle, but my position momentum is not here or here or here. It's anywhere on this. So if I had a classical probability distribution on phase space, suppose that I prepared my harmonic oscillator, but I didn't tell you what little kick in position I'm going to give to you. You had to you just then would assign a probability distribution. I, I said it's it's going to have this energy, but I'm not going to tell you what its initial position and momentum are. Well, then you would say, well, it's on this circle, but I don't know where. Okay, that's a classical hidden variable, missing information. You assign a probability distribution based on your lack of knowledge about that. In which case, the as a function of time, well, the position momentum would be the same probability distribution, because this whole thing is rotation and symmetric. And so that probability distribution would not change as a function of time. Because every point on this curve moves around with angular velocity omega, and they all stay the same. Okay? So that's the quant classical analog of the quantum stationary state. Okay? So if we want to define a, uh, something that looks more like a classically oscillating particle whose position and momentum oscillate with time, we cannot look at a single stationary state. We need to think about a wave packet, which is a superposition of energy eigenstates. In fact, we see that already here in this classical phase space. What we have here is that if I have an energy, a state that has a uh, definite energy, it has a completely uncertain phase. Let's just say the, the classical trajectory is one where this phaser, it, the, the phase of this oscillator, changes as a function of time. here is that from the quantum mechanical point of view, let me say, let me summarize a few things. Uh, to quantum, to see dynamical change in the mean x and P, we need to consider a wave packet superposition of energy. Now, the relationship to the, this notion of phase is the following. We see the time evolution operator generates
rotations in phase space. Right? So this phaser is rotating at an angular velocity omega. So that means that the number operator is the generator of displacements in phase. In the same way that we said momentum was the generator of displacements in position, and position was the generator of displacements in momentum. The number, which is related to the magnitude, is the generator of displacements in phase. In fact, this comes back to another point that's written here. We had two different ways of expressing this complex amplitude. We can express them in terms of the real and imaginary parts, which were the quadratures, which are the position of momentum. And those, we said, satisfied when we quantize them they were the canonical operators and they didn't commute. What about the polar representation? I mean, I can look at this for different energies and there are different coordinates here. I can look at this in polar coordinates, right? Can I write down a polar representation of the uh,
Now, there's a problem with this. What's the problem? Well, in fact, I'm going to put the hat over the whole thing for a reason you'll we'll see why in a moment, not over that. Let's look at what this operator is. We know that this operator in the number basis is the square root of n, n minus 1, n, 1 to infinity, right? This operator is, how, do you, how what is this operator in the number basis? Just diagonal. It's diagonal with eigenvalues. N increasing. So we're Right? That's what this is, right? So it's invertible. One over that is one over the square root. So I can just take the inverse of that. So this tells me that this operator, this thing that was the unitary in the polar decomposition, is equal to n equals 1 to infinity. So I'll write it over here. E to the i pi, that big hat on it. It looks kind of unitary because unitary operators take bases to bases. But there's a problem.
There is no permission observable. Corresponding to phase of the oscillator. Now that's, there's been umpteen papers written about this and what this means, how, how to interpret this, but I can say a few things that are important. This doesn't mean that we can't still talk about the measurements of the phase and the fact that in some sense, number and phase of the oscillator are conjugate variables. In the same way that position and momentum are conjugate. So, if I come back over here, what we said is that if I had a state that had a definite energy, it has a completely uncertain phase. If I want to make something that has a definite phase, it's going to have to have an uncertain energy. Phase and number are conjugate in the same way that position and momentum are conjugate. Let's derive that and explain what we mean. So let's, if I look at the commutator of this operator, equal to <coughs> n minus 1 minus n. Right? Plugging in our value for that. Which is equal to minus So what that says is that in some sense, the number operator looks like the generator of phase translations, which is equal to I d e by d e phi. Or equivalently, I hat is kind of like the derivative of in the same way that position operator looks like the derivative with respect to momentum in the uh, momentum representation, and momentum looks like the derivative of position in the position representation. Now, why isn't this exactly true? Well, it comes back to this picture. You see, I can translate it x and p arbitrarily. But it's the fact that there's this singularity here, this origin. I can't go below n equals 0. If it was really just a derivative, I should be able to go through to the other side. But I can't. And that's the mathematical problem. Nonetheless, what this tells me is that in some sense, as long as I'm not near that singular point, that this is approximately as long as I'm not really close to that singular point. And what that tells me is that there is a kind of number phase uncertainty relation. If I want to create a quantum state that has a well-defined phase, it must have an uncertain 
number, an uncertain entity. It must be a wave packet consisting of many different number states. It's the only way I can do it. The state that has a definite number has a completely uncertain phase. What about states with definite phase? Well, I can define the following. Let's define phase states. to be an equal superposition of all the number states. This is analogous to the fact that a position eigenvector is a uh, superposition of all momentum eigenvectors, and momentum eigenvectors are equal superpositions, right? Why is it fair to call this thing a phase state? I said there was no phase operator. There, was, there is no Hermitian operator that I can consider to be the phase which I could measure. But we do have this operator. Let's see how this operator acts on this state. Representation. 
Well, the problem is that these guys are not orthogonal kets. It's not her mission because these guys are orthogonal. This times this is not this. Nonetheless, we have a way of thinking about phase because we have this relationship. What this is telling us is that we have a resolution of the identity in terms of positive operators. This is what we discussed in the beginning of the semester as a POVM. Which is to say that I can, we have a probability distribution over phase. That's to say, the probability distribution of finding a certain phase is equal to 1 over 2 pi phase states even though I cannot obtain this probability distribution by doing a projective measurement. There is no projective measurement. There is no Hermitian operator whose probability distribution is this. Because these are not our thoughtful projectors. So, one of the things that has been a challenge in quantum metrology, the idea of trying to measure, say, the phase of an oscillator as precise as possible within the confines of quantum mechanics, is how do I design an experiment which gives me this probability distribution? It's a non-trivial thing. Nonetheless, it tells us intrinsically about what the phase uncertainty is. Because that's just related to this probability. This, this is equal to the mean phase minus the average phase. And I can calculate those things. And that time is just whatever the phase of the oscillation is divided by omega. So if I had a phase operator, then I have a time operator. In fact, we know that 
energy is the generator of translations in time. Therefore, we might expect that there's a time operator is the generator of translations in energy. We might expect that. In the same way that we have N is the generator of translations in phase, such that we might expect that phase is the generator of translations in number. But we just showed that mathematically you can't do this because there's a bottom to this. You can't translate below a certain amount. And the same thing is true about there's no time operator. There's no Hermitian operator I can call the time operator because I can't translate an energy below the ground state. There's no mathematical operator that is a Hermitian operator. Nonetheless, we can still talk about in the same way that we talk about measuring position, um, uh, number and phase, we can have an energy time uncertainty pressure. That's to say, if I look at Let me multiply this by h bar omega. Uh, I'm just going to multiply both sides by h bar. And then if I say delta n is equal to uh, delta e divided by h bar omega. And delta phi is equal to delta t over omega for the reasons we just described. Uh, omega delta t, pardon me. Then what I get is delta e delta t is greater than t. You have delta E over h bar equal, greater equal to h bar over 4, right? There's an h bar over here that oh. cancels this one. I can see that one. Yeah. So, time energy uncertainty relation is a slippery business. Slippery in the same way as number phase uncertainty is. But it does have a physical meaning. It just means that it doesn't follow from the same kind of measurements of Hermitian observables. There is no measurement I can do with projective outcomes that are time. It just doesn't exist that. But that does not mean that I can't measure time. We do it pretty poorly on this thing, but we measure it in a different kind of way. In the same way that we measure phase for example, in the interferometer, we can't do it with the Hermitian operator, but we still can measure it, and there are distributions and probabilities, and they satisfy uncertainty principles. All right, we'll conclude there. What we're going to talk about on Thursday, then, is what is the state of the quantum harmonic oscillator that really looks like the classical motion? How do we connect the classical motion of the harmonic oscillator to the quantum mechanical states? They're clearly not the energy eigenstates. They have an uncertain phase. We want something whose phase oscillates. There's some superposition. And we'll talk about those next time.